Hello, I'm Bruce Harders, and this is Voices in the Village. Today we have with us Brett Halsey, an actor and a novelist. This is going to be a two-part program. The first part, we're going to be talking about Brett the novelist. The next part will be about the filming, and particularly his filming overseas in Italy. Brett, thanks for dropping by, and welcome to Voices in the Village. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Great. Well, I understand uh, now you're a novelist. When did you finally decide that you could write something like this? Well, it was one that, do you want to hear the, the bodyguard story? <laughs> no, uh, you've got to shorten it for television. Oh, okay. I first started, actually I first started writing when I was in, in Italy. Um, I would get scripts in, translated into English that was terrible and, and very long, so I would have to rewrite my scripts. For example, in Italy, uh, if you say, I love you, you can't just say, I love you. You have to say, I love you, and then give 10 or 20 reasons why. Whereas in English, you say, I love you, the girl. You know, that'll works. work. That'll do it. So we'd have to cut around things like that. But that's when I started to write. And then, um, then I got the idea to write about those times. Uh -huh. And I told a writer friend of mine uh, the idea, and he said, do some, why don't you do an outline? And I said, okay, and I did. And, and he said, I want to introduce you to the publishers at Bantam. And I met the head editor, and he said, uh, write me a chapter, and I did. And he, then they had me meet the president at the Beverly Hills Hotel. I was there one day, and he said, he said, oh, you actors, you all think you're going to write. I want to see some pages. I want to say, write me three chapters. Then they gave me a contract with a very nice advance. And at the bottom of the contract, it said, uh, if you don't deliver the book, you have to give the advance back. Well, that's when I became a professional author, because there was no way <laughs> I was going to give that advance back. I can understand that. Uh, once you get going with the book, how long does it take you to finish it, average-wise? About a year. So you're on and off. You're, yeah. You write for a month or two, and then you take some time off. That yeah, that's and it takes time. You write a little bit, or write a whole block, and then it takes time for that to, to sink in and, and understand what you said. And, and then you go back and fix it. And th that's the way I write, unfortunately, is write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. Um, my first novel that, that I won some prizes with, um, it was sold to the movies. And I didn't like the book when I'd sold it. So I rewrote it after it had been published. Well, that's it. Just for the, to, in your mind to have. I wanted it better. And, and it was right re thing. republished. But right. You know, uh, oftentimes we hear pe uh, novelists talking about how the characters take on a life of their own. Did, have you found that in your writing? Absolutely. Once I have my characters set in my mind, <clears throat> often if I have a problem, developing the plot, they will talk to me and they will tell me. Maybe that has something to do with schizophrenia or something, I don't know, but they would come into my head and or they will do come in and tell me, oh, you should do this, do this. No, I, oh, I wouldn't say that. No, I'd say it. <laughs> so I think you were saying a few, a little while ago while, while we were off camera that uh, you never feel alone when you're writing a book. Exactly. People often say that writing is a lonely profession, but it's not at all because once you're into it, your characters are with you all the time, talking uh -huh. to you. They don't share a meal with you, but, but they share your head. I would think that a lot of our viewers and listeners out there wonder how in the world that can happen, but we hear that all the time from novelists. It's the process. It's the way it works. It's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you just briefly talk about, you've written now, uh, this is your fourth book? Yeah. Just, could you just briefly talk about the first three books? how they were different or what they were? Well, the first book was um, uh, My Experiences in Rome. It was, it's a novel, uh -huh. and I'm not a character in it, but it's just people that I saw, uh -huh. and it was very successful. The second book was called um, uh, Yesterday's Children. That's a, I call it, a, it's about people making a soap opera when I was working in soap operas. Uh -huh. And uh, the third one is a, is a kind of a noir whodunit, uh, called, um, yeah, um, I forget the name. What's the name of my book? Grave Misunderstanding. Grave Misunderstanding. It's kind of 
kind of a funny idea because um, it's a funny idea. It's a funny idea. Okay, so it. Uh, but I would think that that would have been probably the most fun book. I mean, that who done it kind of thing. Well, it was fun. The, the, the idea is, uh, a man's wife dies. She's buried. Then um, the his new wife kills him and buries him in his ex-wife's grave. Oh boy, that is really complex. To hide her. Well, now we're down to the fourth book. The fourth book, My Soul to Keep. Now you tell them what's, what that's about. Well, it says, a story of tragic love, bloody war, and shameful betrayal in the 19th century California. Right. That's what this is about? That's what it is. Well, talk about that. I am a, a descendant of uh, Juan Francisco Reyes, who was the first alcalde, first elected alcalde of Los Angeles. What's an alcalde? Alcalde is a mayor. Oh, the mayor. Now, of course, Los Angeles at that time had about as many people, not as many people as Laguna Woods Village has now. Uh -huh. But it was a responsible position. And he, he was with Father Junipero Serra when he came. Really? Uh, they came together. Sarah That's was, a long time ago. Uh, well, yeah, it was 1720-something. Yeah. No, no, later. See, because he was mayor in 17, 1762 is when Sarah came. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was mayor in 1790, I believe, 1793. 20, 30 years later. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then my family has, family history has, has progressed through California history along with the facts, and I call this book um, uh, faction, facts and fiction. Not friction, not fiction, faction. Not faction, because yeah. it's some fact. It's full of facts. Full of facts. So what I take the, my fictional characters and put them in the real situations, wars and right, uh, surrounded by real facts. Surrounded by real facts, yeah. And uh, it's, there's some tragedy. There's a. Uh, there's a love story between a, an Indian and a, a Spanish girl, which was strictly forbidden in those times. Really? And um, the problems that they had uh, surviving. They were really, uh, what would you say, they were leading a, a, a new idea back way back then. Oh yeah, because, well as I point out, um, the, 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 the society at that time, they were so closed. Um, it wasn't that a, a girl couldn't, couldn't marry an Indian, she couldn't marry a, a white Protestant American from the other side of the world. Uh -huh. it, they were just very closed. Yeah. And so basically, the, if you condensed it into three or four sentences, what else was it about? Well, it's about what, what happened with the, um, with the Indians. I, I quote uh, Lincoln at one point, um, where Lincoln, uh, with his Emancipation Proclamation, freed the slaves, but he didn't free the American Indians. Oh. And the American Indians were in virtual slavery for years. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't believe the, the Indians were allowed to vote until 1924. Hmm. So I deal a lot with that. Yeah, that was a fascinating period. A lot of yeah. things going on, wasn't it? Yeah, and then, then the war with the Americans and the Mexicans fighting the American army. The Mexicans were, had willow lances to fight the American really? cavalry, and they won a big battle. Uh, I deal with all, all of that. Uh -huh. Well, it, 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 sounds, it sounds like a, one of these books, once you pick it up, you can hardly put it down, with all, especially with all the factual stuff in yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brett, it, it's, uh, I'm glad to have you had a chance to talk a little bit about your book. I love the title, and my soul to keep. I think you said that you always wanted to write a book with this kind of a title. Yeah. yeah. And you finally got to it. Finally found a, a, a good reason, a, a good Great. subject. Great. Well, Brett, thanks for coming by. And for those of you out there, we're going to have part two, where Brett's going to talk about his movie career, particularly in Italy, and then coming back to the States. So any, in any sense, Brett, again, thanks for coming. You folks out there, you come back too. This is Bruce Sarders talking, and this has been Voices in the Village.
Casino goers love winning, and no one gives slot players more ways to win than Valley View Casino and Hotel. That's right, Valley View is the only casino that rewards you with more cash, free slot play, new cars, exciting trips, concert getaways, and more. Plus, when you swipe your Players Club card before you play, you can receive up to 20 times the entries. Remember, your Valley View Casino Players Club card gets you more ways to win, and slot players love it because this card is money. Parkinson's disease is a neurological movement disorder affecting an estimated one million Americans, including many under age 40. It has no cure. Parkinson's is not limited to how a person moves. It can also cause symptoms like depression, fatigue, and impaired speech. Today, there is a new diagnosis every nine minutes, though Parkinson's can be present for years before being diagnosed. The American Parkinson Disease Association is the largest grassroots network in the United States, working to help ease the burden and find the cure. For more than 50 years, APDA has funded pioneering research and provided critical support to those affected by Parkinson's. Visit apdaoptimism.org today to find out how you can help millions live with dignity and optimism. Your action today will help APDA put an end to Parkinson's disease. We love to show people that our sight loss won't hold us back. Thanks to free classes at Braille Institute, we're returning to the things we love. We're connecting with the world using today's technology. And we're learning to get back in the game. Thanks to Braille Institute, it's about what we can do, not what we can't. Get information about free programs available from Braille Institute Anaheim or learn about our new center in South Orange County by calling 1-800-BRAILLE or visit brailleinstitute.org. Hello, I'm Bruce Harders and this is Voices in the Village. Today we have with us Brett Halsey, actor, novelist, and General Bond Beyond. Today we're going to talk about some of his movie career, particularly that in, in the uh, country of Italy and Spain and some other places, and then how he came back from overseas. Uh, we, this is part two. Part one was talking about his role as a novelist. So we have a, on our hands here, we have a novelist and an actor. Brett, thanks for coming by again, and welcome to Voices in the Village. Thank again. <laughs> All right. Now, um, I think this is really fascinating that in your career you ended up in Italy for some 30 years. How did it come about that you, you, you ended up in Italy making these films? Well, I started my career uh, as a teenager in, uh, under contract to Universal. Then I did a series of um, independent movies. Then I went to 20th Century Fox where I did uh, some movies and a television series called Follow the Sun. And while we were shooting Follow the Sun, I got an offer from this director in Italy who wanted me to do a film. I couldn't do it because I was busy. Then when the series was dropped, the day that I received notice that it hadn't been picked up, I got an offer from that director to make another film in mm. Italy. So I went to Italy and made, made the film. It was a sword fighting film. They called them Capo Espada, um, Cape and Sword. Cape and Sword. And uh, then when I came back, I did another film here with Vincent Price, wonderful actor. And while I was doing that film, I got an offer to go back to Italy to make three films. Same, same director? Same director, yeah. For the first film, not for all of them. But I went back, I did those three films, and when that was finished, I had another film, and by then I was an Italian actor. <laughs> So uh, I, did, I think I did something over 40 films there. Really? Yeah. Now, how different was it uh, acting in Italy? And I guess you did some things in Spain. How, how different was that from making a film here in America? Uh, filming there isn't as structured as it is here. The, the, uh, you have a lot more liberty. It's things, um, although they do have a schedule, they're, they're very loose with it. I can remember. For example, like you'd go to work in the morning and you'd fool around, have a coffee, get a couple shots maybe, go to lunch, 
Then at the end of lunch, the production manager would come and say, oh my God, look what time it is. We, have, we don't, don't even have half our day shoot. Then we'd <laughs> go like hell and get, get it done. And, and uh, a lot more collaboration. I know that, well, for example, I did one picture with a, a director, um, Lucio Fulci, who was one of the great uh, horror directors. And we, he had a pretty standard horror script, and we looked at it and talked about it. And I said, you know, we could have some fun with this. We could make this into a black comedy. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we made it into a black comedy. You had that freedom to, to work more with the, with the directors. Now, what's a black comedy? What's, how is that? What's that different? Black comedy means uh, more serious. I, I guess we're, we're, death is funny. I see. <laughs> That is funny. That's a that's a good yeah. uh, that's good. Um, now, so all, all together, you were over there around what thirty some years. Well, I, my career lasted thirty years. I didn't stay there all that time. Oh, you were going back and forth. Uh, the first fifteen years, I, I was there all the time. Then I came back here and did some work here, but uh, I was still called to go back there. Uh -huh, uh -huh. After being away from here all those years. My career here was pretty well over yeah. uh, as, a, as a leading man star. Right, right. Uh, but not there. Right. So I would go back. So <clears throat> while I was here, I did some soap operas, um, right. a lot of television, some commercials. Uh -huh. But um, my last film, my last film in Italy was another, what we, we went through uh, like the Spaghetti Westerns, uh, Spaghetti James Bond. The last series was Spaghetti Horror. And I did a <laughs> series of horror films. And then uh, the same period of time, I did that film and uh, Godfather Three shot in Rome. Uh -huh. uh, that film I shot also in New York, but <clears throat> mostly in Rome. Is that right? I didn't realize that. Yeah. So, did you live in Rome uh, for pretty much? Oh, yeah, there? yeah. How did you find Rome at that time? We were talking about the 50s now, right? Uh, 60s. 60s? Yeah. It was wonderful. You know, the traffic wasn't a problem. Uh, living was inexpensive. I was very well paid. Food was good. Food was, oh, food is magnificent. Yeah. Um, there's a saying, the, the, the Italians say, a, a meal without wine is like a day without sunshine. <laughs> now, uh, among other things, you were the old Spice Man. How did that come about? Uh, an agent called me and said, um, "We." This was William Morris. He said, "We uh, we uh, have a an opening for the audition for the uh, Old Spice Sailor," and. Uh, one of our people is doing the auditions. Wake up. Wake up with Old Spice and feel the freshness of the open sea. Wake up with Old Spice. Feel the spray on your face and the wind at your back. Come on, wake up to the freshness of the open sea with Old Spice and get a super smooth shave with Old Spice Shave Cream. And I became the uh, Old Spice Sailor, which was a, I made a lot of money with it, had a lot of fun with it, a lot of notoriety. I remember once I was in New York with my children when they were small, and we were walking through Central Park, and this bum on the side says, hey man, you got a quarter? He didn't look, hey, hey, you good, good. He said, well, how about a bottle of Old Spice? <laughs> <laughs> so I gave him a dollar. <laughs> yeah, that was a good So job. you'd go into a restaurant and people would start looking at you trying to figure out, who, isn't that the Old Spice guy? Yeah, yeah. That, that happened. How many years did that happen before people stopped recognizing you as the Old Spice guy? Oh, well, shortly after. Shortly. <laughs> yeah, because I was doing other, other things. Uh-huh. I think I was became better known here, at least in in the soaps. In Europe, it was westerns and. Uh, what What was your most famous soap, or your best soap? Oh well, I liked. I don't know. Um, Search for uh, Search for Tomorrow was good. 
I, and then um, um, General Hospital, of course, and uh, Young and the Restless. You, you have a funny story about uh, your, your hospital role when you were writing, getting oh. involved with, with this book. Uh, when I was doing research for my, my Soul to Keep, which is a story of old California. And this yeah. is your latest book? That's the one. Brett the Novelist. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I'd heard about, in my research, about the Ramona story, about the famous Ramona, California her heroine novel, a uh, novel about her. So I, I went in to, to visit uh, what I heard was her grave. Well, there were four or five Ramonas. There was never a real one. But I wanted to see this grave. And to make a long story short, uh, this particular graveyard, uh, white people aren't supposed to go there. The Indians keep white people away. But I wanted to see if I could get close to it. So I went and uh, there was this little building by the graveyard and I went and knocked on the door. And this little old Indian woman came and she opened the door and she looked at me and she looked. Ah! Dr. Streeter. <laughs> she recognized me from General Hospital. So you didn't have any trouble getting no in? No trouble at all. I, right, I could have dug on. up that Ramona and put her in my car and took right, her home. Right, right. So today you're not, you're doing more writing than acting, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And you're finding that to be a, a lot of fun and quite a challenge, I would think. Yeah, yeah, I like acting. I was supposed to do a film, uh, sp another spaghetti western in Spain in the spring, but as my acting is much slower. I did, last year I did a Western here, and I did two movies in uh, Canada. But mainly I'm, I'm writing now. Uh -huh. And uh, you write uh, pretty, what, what time of the day do you usually write? I write in the morning and in the afternoon, and when, I, when it's cooking I'll, 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 I'll work on a schedule like say 10 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon mm -hmm. or 5 in the afternoon and then try to keep to that. It depends on how, how serious the project has me in its grasp. <laughs> well, Brett, thank you again for dropping by. And for all of you out there, I hope you enjoyed our part two. I'm Bruce Harders. This is Voices in the Village. Come back and see us again. Bye-bye. <laughs>